So, patches over our repair, where are we in 2024? Of course, here you can see my disclosures. So, are we using patches to augment our rotator cuff repair? Well, if you look at the literature certainly, there are many instances it can be used, and there is a lot of literature that will show you that it is an effective answer to many of our patients with more difficult calf repairs. There are many different available uh, uh, patches that you can use. They can be xenografts or allografts or even autografts. You can use your, their own fa facial out of the patient. And if you look at the literature, you will find a lot of case series showing off that all these different grafts are good and will have good clinical and radiological outcomes in the short term. If you are more critical and you just try to have a look at what are the important characteristics of a patch, these have been well uh, presented in the literature, literature by Schneider and also by Chayani earlier on. We need uh, patches that have high mechanical resistance, that they have excellent suture retention and attach firmly to the bone. They have to have a slow degradation or no degradation. They need to be uh, available to the grade with non-toxic products. They have to be biocompatible, bioinductive, and ideally bioconductive too. As you can see, basically, there are some mechanical characteristics that a patch needs to fulfill, and there are also some biological characteristics that the patch needs to fulfill. And this is important, because if you go through the literature, most of these uh, studies, this, uh, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis performed by Bile in 2016, and this is only in court studies and randomized controlled trial that compare uh, have good control groups. And they found that graft augmentation appeared to provide a lower return rate. When you compare it to rotator cuff repair alone, this is 2019, you go farther in 2022, the Andrade uh, included a couple of uh, newer studies uh, from, the, from, from Dr. Avanzi, for example, and they did find that if you look at return rates and compare it to a control group with the standard repair techniques, you will get a benefit. It, you will get a reduction in return rate. But what these two autos found is that if you look at clinical outcomes, it is very difficult to find clear differences. So they wanted to make sure that to have the readers understand that there was a still way to go and more studies were needed about that. So probably after this bunch of studies I have presented you, the question should be why are not using them more, with, more frequently? Because in general, you can expect a failure rate of around 20% general in your rotator cuff repairs. If you are using it for larger, doing larger or massive rotator cuff repairs, this failure rate will go up to 50%. So there is a lot of patients that might benefit from this type of patches. The truth is that most of the time, time these patches won't answer your problems. If you are concerned, about mechanical resistance, if you are concerned about the strength of your sutures, if you think your sutures are not strong enough, if you think you have more, need more points of fixation, that the stiffness and the rigidity and the strength of your repair is not good enough, then definitely traditional patches are what you need. And this is quite in line with Dr. Sanders, just a few minutes said. But if you are more concerned about what Adrian and my other colleague said a few minutes ago that the problem is related to biology, that the problem is related to poor tissue quality in the tendon, that you are addressing patients who do not have rotator cuff tears, that have rotator cuff disease, then the problem is not really mechanical, it's biological. And these traditional patches do not seem to work as well biologically wise. So are there any biological alternatives? Uh, for most of us in Europe, this uh, was presented to us around four years ago from our colleagues in the US and, and elsewhere in the world. It has been around for a, a lot more time. This is a collagen bioinductive implant. The idea is that you place it over the, the, the heel tendon, the healing tendon. Uh, you don't get a strong fixation into the tendon. It will just stay there 
and you hope that these biological properties will allow the tendon, the tendon cells to migrate into the collagen and integrate this collagen into the, the native tendon. This has been shown in animal studies, in uh, different animal studies, but it also has been shown in humans. And this was uh, showed with biopsy studies by Steve Arnowski, and he found that if they look at the collagen implant at five weeks, they did not see much, perhaps a few cells around there, but with time, tendon tissue developed over there. And at six months, it was indistinguishable from healthy tendon tissue. So this should work or not? If you will, go back to the characteristics of a patch, this is way from perfect because it does not have high mechanical resistance. You are not expected to pierce it with sutures or powerful uh, screws because it has not a very good mechanical capabilities. And it will degrade very quickly. At six months, there is no uh, implant no longer over there. But it does seem to have some biological properties that might be helpful for us. Do we know anything about its efficacy? Well, Dr. Sawa from New Orleans presented in 2019 his early experience in very complex cases, in the type of complex cases we are expecting to have very high failure rates, and he had impressive outcomes. So in very difficult cases, he had a healing rate of 91%. This is large, massive tears, half of them previous surgeries. Very, very tough cases. And we have also some data on safety, because if you think about it, when you are using something that is new, you have to make sure that you are not harming your patient. And this study by Tom showed uh, uh, more than 100 patients treated with the, with the new bioinductive implant, and it looked like that it was safe on our patients. So, as usual, you know, you get all this data from the U.S., and uh, I was really a skeptic when I uh, had this data around in, in, the, in, in 2020. So we decided to do a random mass control trial in Spain with a couple of friends, Jose Luis Avila, Miguel Garcia, and Ablet. This was a randomized prospective uh, randomized control trial. We included 120 patients. It was blinded. And basically what we did is we selected mid-sized to large uh, supraspinatus infraspinatus tears without subscapularis involvement, and we repaired them. And we excluded uh, patients who had severe fat infiltration or retraction or very large tears. So this was medium and large tears, and we repaired them completely. And when we were satisfied with the outcome and with we did a transosus equivalent repair, then we randomized the patients either to finishing the procedure or adding the bioinductive implant. And this is what we found. Uh, we ended up including 124 patients, and we were able to assess MRIs at one year follow-up. We also have the clinical follow-up, but at one year's follow-up, you know that clinical follow-up probably is not that interesting, but the MRI data at one year, as it has been said before, probably will pick up all your failures, your anatomical failures. The groups were quite similar. Regarding complications, we had a couple of deep, deep infections, one in each group, a couple of superficial infections, one local skin burn, one antrum protrusion, and one four inch body. There were basically no differences between groups. And what is the outcomes regarding healing rate? As you can see in the control group, we have a failure rate of around 26%, which is in line with the reported failure rate in this type of TERS in the literature, and in the bioinductive implant group, we had a failure rate of 8.3%. Um, these differences were strongly significant. Um, more, more interestingly, we look at when did the tendon, where did the tendon fail? Uh, as we have seen before, sometimes the problem with the tendon is that it fails to heal into the footprint, and then it tears away from the footprint, but sometimes, especially if the tendon is diseased and you are using transosseous equivalent techniques, the problem is that the, the sutures will tear through the tendon and you will have a medial failure or a musculotendinous failure. Here you can see that we were, you know, with our technique, with transosseous equivalent repair, we are quite sure that we will get tendon to bone healing no matter what you do because the failure rate is below 4%. 
in both groups. But where the bioinductive collagen implant excelled was at the level of the tendon itself. There, there was a significant reduction in the return rate at that level. So the bioinductive uh, implant does seem to help you prevent these type two failures, these failures that develop medially to your repair. There's a lot of data in the study. It was a large study. Uh, you can have access. It has just been published in arthroscopy, and it's, it's free access. So if you are interested, just please download it and have a look at it. And just to conclude, where are we today in 2024? I think that traditional dermatic patches are there. We have good evidence that they will increase your healing rate, but you won't get much functional improvements, and it's, they seem to be more mechanical answers to our problems. So if you think that the problem in your patient is mainly mechanical, probably this will be an answer. The newer bioinductive implants, such as the one I presented before, have very poor mechanical properties, but seem to excel biology-wise. And at least from the results in my randomized controlled trial, they seem to produce improved results. Thank you very much.